When my mama was five years old, Britain's leading composer, Sir Edward Elgar, wrote some music in her honor. He called this piece Dreaming. But at that point, he couldn't have dreamt that one day she would be queen. as we celebrate her 90th birthday, she, like all of us, can reflect on a life that has inspired and encouraged millions of people in the United Kingdom, the Commonwealth, and around the world. In many ways, it's a life that has defined our age. Four years ago, at the time of the Queen's Diamond Jubilee, I looked back through some of her own cinefilms to pay her a personal tribute. Now she has allowed us to delve deeper into this remarkable collection, and other members of the family have joined me in watching it, often for the very first time. It's footage shot by the Queen herself and my father, and occasionally by my aunt, Princess Margaret. Like my grandparents, King George VI and Queen Elizabeth, they often had a cine camera at the ready. The whole collection provides a wonderful insight into my mama's long life. This must be Balmoral. In the 50s. That's Granny pushing Margot. <laughs> So that train, I remember being on that train. That train is still there. I don't think it looks like that anymore. No. It certainly isn't red. It's exactly what we used to do. Yeah. <laughs> I think you and I ended up upside down and outside yeah, the car yeah, a few yeah, times. way more than... <laughs> Grandpa was in quite a reliable job there. Is Anne going to go down that hill and that? Please say she does. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh, great. That's very That's nearly quite embarrassing, Grandma. Grandma. <laughs> <laughs> I think Grandma's more fun than, uh, yeah. than everyone else's. It's much more fun. <laughs> He's got the technique nailed. There's something about banks that small children want to go and do the whole time. Uh, Roll down them. George is the same. More rolling. Yeah. Family tradition. That and planting trees. <laughs> if she won't roll by herself, roll, yeah. I'll roll her for her. I think she's how to roll. That was the first summer that my mother was queen. Good driving, well done. I'll let you get. <laughs> that little blue car's still there as well. Uh, I've seen that around. That we haven't seen. No. That's fantastic. Is that electric? Or is his, or is his legs furiously going? <laughs> it's like one of those uh, Flintstone cars. <laughs> yeah. Good to see the Oh, I'm trying to run down his sister. He's got a little L on as well, sweet. And he's got his cushion, which he still has now. <laughs> yes. That's, that's ridiculous. I mean, at the age of... What is he there, four? Uh, yeah. Five, maybe. <laughs> Some debate who's going to drive. PC 1953. There yeah, yeah, look at that, yeah. Nice. Health and safety, no, not an issue then. It's <laughs> also good. It's quite sweet. 
That's such a cool car. The ability to play outdoors and just entertain yourselves was endless. And even if that was climbing trees or um, just going off on your own, whether they'd be on a bicycle or a pony. So that was, there was a lot of that. But a lot of it was done together. It must be in the genes. It was exactly the same for my mother and Princess Margaret growing up in the 1930s. Life was so much simpler for children then because we didn't have telly, so we had to invent things. And and one of them was catching happy days, which was involved a lot of exercise, but one had to run about the lawn like crazy, catching leaves as they fell off the trees. And uh, that kept us going for quite a long time. a very horsey person, but um, I can remember spending hours uh, in a field near Burke Hall when we were trotted and walked and cantered and jumped. The Queen organised us and we, we were all horses doing different things. I saw her last December, astonishing the way she seems completely untouched uh, by age. I mean, you, I, I know she's older than I am, but, but I don't really feel she's much older. But of course, a good deal more experienced than I am. Just run up the stairs, man. She is remarkable. Um, I don't know how she's managed to achieve or keep going at the speed and the pace that she has over the years. <laughs> she walks every day and she still rides. Um, I'm sure exercise and, and a sort of moderate diet contributes to the length of life. Yes. How many languages did you say? The students can speak 60 different 60 languages. Different languages. So it's, it's a... She was always an active person, and, and I think she's remained active, but she's also remained curious and mentally curious. It was last September that the Queen's reign became the longest in British history, a moment other people were more excited about than she was. Don't forget, there's a very double-edged sword, this, as uh, people tend to forget. Uh, when she passed the um, longest reigning monarch, that was only because her father died so young. You know, it's a record that she would much rather not have been able to pass. From the Great Hall in the Palace of Westminster, they bear George VI as the hour sounds for his last journey. Now Britain buries her king and the nations come to pay their homage. Tragic in somber black, the ladies of his house follow, the Queen, the Queen Mother, and Princess Margaret, together in their grief. Behind the Queen's coach walk the four royal dukes. Prince Philip on the left, and the Duke of Gloucester, the Queen's uncle, the Duke of Windsor, also her uncle, and then me. And the 16-year-old Duke of Kent, First time I'd met the Duke of Windsor, who was my uncle, and he was also my godfather. Hardly anybody knew him, you know. He'd been, he'd been out of the country for the last 15 years, since the abdication. And I'm very conscious all the time that I had to keep up with the, my uncles and cousins. Past Tyburn and along the Edgware Road. We went all the way from Westminster Hall um, eventually to Paddington Station, but it was certainly quite a long way. And then a bit more, of course, when we got down to, uh, to Windsor. As the Queen's and Princess watch, the royal coffin is brought to the train, and the King leaves London no more to return.
My grandmother was still in mourning that spring of 1952, when my mama, now the young queen, filmed my sister and me in the gardens of Royal Lodge at Windsor. So this must be just before the coronation. A typical lineup. Grandpa's always there on hand. Good to see. Granny looking stunning. Yeah. She's beautiful. Look at those jewels sparkling. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> She was a very, well, it, glamour is the wrong word for her, but she was also a, a glamorous person as a very young queen in those days. But she also has great warmth, and the two together make her something very, very special. At the time of the coronation, in 1953, my parents commissioned a private film to capture the scene at Buckingham Palace as everyone in their finery lined up to travel in procession to Westminster Abbey. Wonderful. Winston looks wonderful with his tricorn hat on. Oh, well, that's Lady Churchill. <laughs> mm. Wonderful. Marvellous, I've not seen this before. Huh. I've tried to... I think that's the Princess Royal, isn't it? Or by Batten, I can see. Probably giving orders to somebody. Uh, that's my mother, Princess Mary, you know, and her own sister. Carrying a coronet, my sister is, I know she's. <laughs> that's me. That's, <laughs> that's my mother sitting in the carriage. My brother, Michael, and my sister, Alexandra. Having some trouble with the window, apparently. There's no apparent nerves at all. No. Wonderful sight. Very small. God, looking very small. Looks slightly like nervous as well. Do you think? Yeah. Yes, very nervous. <laughs> One way of travelling, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> the carriage is amazing, isn't it? Prince Philip doing his homage, I guess. I, Philip, to become your liege man of life and limb, and of earthly worship. In faith and truth I will bear unto you to live and die against all manner of folks, so help me God. I think that's me. Right, he said, the archbishop, or bishop as he was then, holding up the words which I had methodically learned for weeks beforehand. Tried to memorize them for a long time before, and I thought I got it all absolutely by heart. You know, and then I saw him holding the card, so I needn't have worried. Prince Charles, of course, a very small Prince Charles and his sister. Assume 
that's on the return. I don't imagine that either of us have a great deal of help at that stage. No. That's quite an impressive sight, isn't it? <laughs> Look at everyone's just sparkling. Yeah, it's a lot of jewellery. That's unbelievable. Grandpa trying to do some ushering. Will you will you get in? Yeah. Everyone, come on. <laughs> you can see why he got fed up with doing family <laughs> photos after this. Can you imagine how hot and how long this must have gone on for? Look at those dresses, they're incredible. Light on them, it's amazing. They're getting so young as well. Yeah. That's helpful, isn't it? Yeah. Well done. Well it's just what every photographer wants to yeah, see. Exactly. <laughs> just prolong the situation even more. Yes, that was senior nanny like body. Well, she was senior senior nanny, and she had a slightly different way of treating senior child to junior child. <laughs> I don't think we'll go any further. I, you know, you, you were conscious of the fact that she had become the sovereign, and you accorded her the, the sort of respect that was her due. My mother had very firm ideas about, um, you know, the relationships with, with, uh, with the sovereign and how important it was that we bowed correctly and curtsied and kissed our hand and that kind of thing. And she wanted to make sure we did that properly. To arrive in India for the first time is an unforgettable experience for anyone in any age. How much more so for the Queen, for whom the magic of air travel in a few hours translated the January gloom of London into the tropical brilliance of New Delhi. It wasn't very long after independence. And um, my mama had never been there before. So that tour was, I think, a very important one. If I venture any of the names, my mama will tell me I've got them wrong, of course. <laughs> but Mr. Nero is still a like, ray. Half a century had passed since a reigning monarch last visited India. Her grandfather, George V, may have you know, told her a few things. Because remember, they went out for the Delhi Derva in 1911, I think it was. Because, of course, when you go to Sandringham, the wonderful thing there is it's full of all the things that King Edward VII, my great-great-grandfather, brought back from his tour of India in 1870, when he was Prince of Wales. Extraordinary. So on the walls are all these amazing bits of, you know, weaponry and shields and swords. This was an India evoking memories of the historic Delhi Durma, held in honour of the King Emperor George V, the Queen's grandfather. This is Jaipur, yes, which I've been to, but I haven't been, I haven't been, never been in an elephant. It must have been an amusing experience. Certainly... But I remember, well, I'm not telling you about all this, because it swayed about, you can imagine. You are very high up, slightly alarming. In the fortress stadium of the Lahore Cantonment was held Pakistan's national horse and cattle show. Do look at these splendid things. Pictures of the show and much else of the royal tour will provide home movies for the Queen's children. As if Mama used to, whatever she could, she took some photos. A few still pictures this time. Well, my father did. Yeah, exactly, you see. Dancing Stalin. What a contrast was the northwest frontier and the world-famous Khyber Pass. You see, they were so lucky because they managed to get to these places. Along a motor road built in the 1920s, now came the Queen and Prince Philip, nearing the border between Pakistan and her rugged neighbour, Afghanistan. We never got to the Khyber Pass, sadly. We were due to go. It's all got too... Tragically, it's all got become too dangerous and too difficult. 
awaiting the Queen were men whose forebears were among the historic enemies of Britain. Many a warrior who came to meet the Queen remembered the stirring times when a few crack shots, well hidden in this wild country, could take toll of the finest troops. <laughs> They've always been heavily armed, haven't they? Ideal place for an ambush. Did you love the moustache? The largest crowds of the tour, however, were in Calcutta. It's estimated that more than two million people in the Commonwealth's second largest city lined their streets. But all this open car stuff, slightly alarming, obviously, being left standing up on your own. Never before have the Queen and Duke been welcomed by such large numbers of people. But you see, I remember so well trying to ring my parents from the school I was in. I remember being taken into a little room, uh, probably the headmaster's study or something, I suppose, and I sat there, you see, with the telephone, and all you could hear was endless connections going on, you know, between one place, one operator and another. And finally there was a click, and then f there was, a, again, a distant... A distant voice in a bunch of what it sounded like an enraging storm, the, the sea and the wind and everything else. So we had managed to get sort of two words out whereupon it went click, gone. So we went through the whole process all over again, finally had a few words at the end of it all. Even in 1961, it was a major exercise to, to talk to anybody at that distance. She's been to every country that there is in the world, pretty much, um, and it's hard to go somewhere that she hasn't been. And I think it's actually impossible. <laughs> there are, in fact, quite a few places that she hasn't managed to visit. Not so long ago, my parents kindly supported my son, Harry, by meeting some of the people about to walk to the South Pole for charity. Mm. Oh. <laughs> that was at Buckingham Palace? Yeah, South Pole Challenge. Actually, Granny and Grandpa are very sweet to say, bring them along and get them to come in and say hello, which is very kind. This is your walk in the wind, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Grandpa probably wondering why on earth we're walking to the South Pole. Yeah. I thought that a lot of times. This is um, Dominic West, and there's an Englishman in the, on the cloud. In the, <laughs> <laughs> the Commonwealth team. Yeah, non-military. I'm in real trouble. <laughs> Granny, he's in the team to so slow the Commonwealth team down. Yeah. <laughs> we call him our anchor. No, really. <laughs> I think Granny's trying to work out why Dominic West is in the lineup <laughs> and why he hasn't brushed his hair. <laughs> Everyone else looks relatively smart apart from him. It is a sort of bug, isn't it, that people get? They like going to the coldest places. Yeah. Freeze, yeah. don't they? Yeah. Lose bits and pieces. <laughs> Have you been? No, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a classic example of someone slightly panicking, not really knowing yeah. what to say to the Queen, and crumbling yeah. under the pressure. <laughs> yes, no, no, I didn't think anything would really make me go down last. Mm. His worst question he's ever asked. Poor Dominic. Stick to acting. The guide for the, uh, the US team mm -hmm. and took myself and Prince Harry to the North Pole. Oh, last did you? Time oh, you did you? That was brave. Shared a tent with him, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's incredibly brave. Right? <laughs> on my part, I survived. When you go on official tours to you know, the Bahamas, Belize, and all those places, my first proper tour representing her, I was bricking myself. I was incredibly nervous. I was wondering what, you know, people are going to be disappointed that it's me and not her, and will I get it all right? Will I, you know, make any mistakes? So you know, there, is a, there is a huge amount of pressure and a huge weight on our shoulders, but, you know, she's led the way. And I think she's more than happy to let you, let you crack on. If you, if you get it wrong, then she'll tell you. And I'll likewise, if we get it wrong, then we'll go up and apologise. We've all had to learn the ropes. My sister and I did our first royal tour with my parents all over Canada in 1970. It was... Memorable. It was the longest days of our lives. We arrived in Nuvig, then went to Tukta Yaktuk, which was somewhere in the Arctic Circle. It was a military exercise in the middle of nowhere. Well, this helicopter really wasn't very far away, and it started to rain. Oh, this was very funny. Did you see the helicopter hovered? 
<laughs> it was doing a demonstration. <laughs> and because it was raining anyway and blowing. And we all, everybody's umbrellas are all sucked inside out in the stands. I mean, it went on for hours. I have to say, you had to keep your sense of humour because it was, we were all very inappropriately dressed <laughs> for that kind of treatment. <laughs> At the tiny township of Fort Providence, the royal family found more than the usual airport reception waiting for them. The, <laughs> yes. the horror of the black flies and the mosquitoes you cannot believe. It's like... No respecters of persons, royal or otherwise. Well, they always said that the black flies were really bad and they, they didn't give us any nets. <laughs> That's why I think my mother's in a trouser suit, because sensibly advised, these people are trying to get away from the insects. <laughs> I don't remember, of course. It's the glams. No, because you see, how old do you think you were then? About just, here? just tottering. Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Marvelous. Well, look, go away. <laughs> do you remember what that one was Glen called? Glen or Glen or somebody? Ah. And I was very busy. Yeah. Emptying and then putting everything back in yeah. again. Well, hopefully everything's... No, some of it doesn't go back in again. Where is this again? That's not Glowers, is it? Well... I, don't, I think that's London. It must be, mustn't it? Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Extremely painful. Yeah. I won't do it again. But do you think that pram's somewhere still, is it? I have never seen it again. <laughs> now I've got into it. Yes, it's the, it's the garden at 145 Piccadilly. In fact, no, no. These pictures were taken when my grandmother was Duchess of York. She used to take my mother up from London to Glam's Castle, the Scottish home of her parents, the Earl and Countess of Strathmore. My mother was one of the eldest daughters of the Strathmores, and the Queen Mother was the, positively the youngest. I think there were ten children in all. Anyway, they were sisters. My mother and the Queen's mother were sisters, and thus makes me a first cousin to the Queen. But my, my grandparents, um, Claude, the 14th Earl or something, he was a wonderful man. He smoked cigarettes and he had an enormous bushy moustache. And so as children, one was always waiting in eager anticipation for his moustache to catch fire, which would have been very enlivening and enjoyable. But I don't think it ever did. When my mama was five, there was a big family gathering at Glam's. There was a lot of leeway for a lot of grandchildren. <laughs> there were mountains of them, weren't there? That's my grandparents' oh, golden wedding. David, get out oh, of the way. David. <laughs> Isn't that amazing, the whole line of them? Well, there were a lot of grandchildren. We, we ended up at the bottom of the line, practically. Okay. And there's... That's Margaret. Margaret. And that's my grandmother. Oh, I always wish I'd met. <laughs> <laughs> Who's that holding on to? Tidder, I think. Is it? Cousin Tidder. Going quite fast. But this must have been taken by. By your papa, was I it? think so, probably. Yeah. You know, that family was a, a surprise to the king 
And I think he enjoyed going back then. Seeing this footage for the first time helps us to understand where my grandmother got her sense of fun from and how she passed that on to her own family. My great uncle, David Boslan at the back. <laughs> it was revelation to the king to see what a big family was like in its home, you know. Being brought up by King George V and Queen Mary, they were very, I don't know, I may be wrong, but I mean, it, it felt as if they were rather un, unloving, you know, unshowing of love. Um, and he saw this ebullient, wonderful Boslan family of huge numbers, and they all got on frightfully well. Again, she was always dreaming up something wonderfully dotty to do. Like <laughs> congress round the house and things like that. <laughs> this is frightfully unkind. And he was such a dear man. He was permanently. <laughs> and I don't think the corgi is enjoying it very much. Yeah. No, the corgi certainly isn't. Arthur Penn was, by then... Oh, he was just a great my friend, grandmother's, I think. I know, but he wasn't... He became her private secretary. He did, didn't he, but... And treasurer. And then... <laughs> got her. <laughs> and all the dogs joining in. Yes. It's really rough stuff, isn't yes. it? Yes. Extraordinary. Yeah. It's always such fun having somebody like that to hit. Yes, well, and we had it. Dick Molyneux, and Dick Lyons, who put up with everything. Everything. Like that, Until one day he he got fed up and he and he was teased so much that he upset the ink pot over Uncle Alger's head. <laughs> Did he? Yes. <laughs> Which shook me. I mean, you know, I'd never seen anybody behave like that. Funny, wasn't it's taken an awful long time to get the ink out. Well, it did, because he had a very crinkly nose, and, and it all went it all down through the lines. Ah, <laughs> and not much fun with the pumice tail on no. the nose. No, exactly. So I was shocked, mm. I must say. I didn't know that people <laughs> behaved like that. Uh, what, he got driven to distraction yeah. by being teased mm. mercilessly? Because, yeah. I mean, one day he got so teased that he jumped fully clothed into the swimming pool at Royal Lodge. Did he? Yes, in Ascotry. <laughs> Uh, this is Andrew and Edward. Uh, do you think that's at um, Frogmore, is it all? No, I think it's in the garden London, in London. London. Because we were... Yes. That's rather good, that. Isn't it? it, it we were allowed to, to rake the leaves and yes. put them in the... <laughs> that's Edward, isn't it? Isn't yes. Busily sucking the thumb. <laughs> and if that was left to the siblings, they would have been buried completely, I dare say. We certainly spent more time outside, probably, than the modern generations do. Holcomb Beach was always a great expedition, and still is, really. Good way of wearing out children than ours. Still is, actually. <laughs> Do you remember doing this? Yes, absolutely, something? vividly. I always remember how far one had to walk to get to the sea very often because of the tide. Yes, miles. I remember finding a dead whale out there once. <laughs> Endless hours of being... But look at the size of the beach. Astonishing, isn't it? I 
Holcomb was a bit off the beaten track. It does look almost completely empty, which you wouldn't find now. Um, it would be have many more people on it. But it was, it was a public beach even then, so... Um, but it's a big beach. Always such fun playing hide-and-seek in those in the dunes. dunes. I remember that so well, mm. isn't it funny? Vividly. And in those days, you didn't mind the prickly grass. No. <laughs> it was quite prickly too, wasn't it? Well, so Papa joins him. <laughs> that I remember. Feeling you're never going to get out. <laughs> it's such a good photograph, <laughs> that one, isn't it? But he doesn't think that's funny at all. No, no. no sun, sand it's, starts to move. It's revolting, that are. Uh... Old jokes are the best, aren't they, really? <laughs> I wonder if you get away with burying your children, Alice. <laughs> Well, I think this is um, Holcomb Beach, uh, if my notations are right. This is 1967. Ah. Oh. So, um, my Queen and Princess Margaret, as well as my father, to Edinburgh. And I think that was Princess Margaret's King Charles Spaniel, which she had. So that must be, yes, David Lindley, and this will be Andrew. Prince Andrew. Not brilliant, these photographs, are they? But there you go. I did it as a hobby at school. Who nicked my camera? <laughs> Must you? Yes. No, I think we'll no. do without that. <laughs> Still climbing sand dunes, you notice? And I managed to... Her experience would have been very similar but there's less evidence of her growing up at these sort of places. But I think it, even for her, it's probably not changed very much. You tend to assume that the next generation isn't going to like what the previous generation did. But all of that kind of outdoor life has always been hugely popular. And I think that's something that she probably enjoys recognising, is that that, uh, that generational enjoyment is still there. remember the bond between my mother and her sister, Princess Margaret. And you can see from these films, it was there from the very start. It's very revealing, actually, how, how that closeness started with how young they were. And that never... that never got weaker as they got older. If anything, probably just got stronger and stronger. So they're singing. And these are the, well, some song my grandmother taught us when we were younger. But I think my aunt knows more than my mother. But I don't remember what this song was. That's the sweetest thing, isn't it? But singing must have been a huge part of their lives, I think. Is it something that they both shared very much? Now, what are you doing there? 
Oh, oh under the spreading singing. chestnut. Not no? quite, but it was singing something. <laughs> Taught by Granny. Well, I suppose so, yes. <laughs> I remember hearing them singing together. It's very moving. It's something you, you don't forget. He's dressed in overalls. <laughs> Gardening? Yes. <laughs> now, now you see, interestingly enough, I've had it done, so Margaret has to have, have it, it done. done. exactly. Certainly when they were small, it was very much Lilibet being the elder sister who would teach her younger sister how to behave. She's tiny. <laughs> oh. Well, my aunt's trying to be a horse, because I can't quite see the expression on my mother's face, whether she's enjoying being pretend spanked or not. I love my mother being the horse in this. Oh, no, the pony, I would say, in this. I love the reverse role here. It was your turn to be. <laughs> <laughs> Driven. Well, we're always very fair. Yes. Now that is what? The V&A. Yeah, the Victorian Albert yacht. But she lasted till when? Oh, until the beginning of the war. Of the war. I mean, this was, this was 1930. Mm. Uh, seven. So the older sister is teaching the younger sister, isn't she? Oh, gosh. And that's Granny teasing. That is so sweet. I wonder who that was in the background. She lurched out of the way. <laughs> was that a Western Isles trip? Where were you, do you think? No, we were going from Port <laughs> Portsmouth to Aberdeen. Uh, Go out of the way. <laughs> this is the Palais Glide, I think. Oh, Glide. So who was the other person there? That is Miss Crawford. Oh, Miss Crawford. Oh, who was the governess? Uh, governess. Yes. Oh, those are the days. I've never seen this before. This is really charming. Remember those chairs too? Well, they did spend a lot of time outside. If, even when it was very cold, my grandmother would love to have a cup of tea outside or lunch if it was sunny. In the old days, I think my mother would probably enjoy it less. And this is a picnic in the in the. Sunken God. Yes. With my father reading the newspaper for some mysterious reason. <laughs> That's Miss Crawford again. Yeah. <laughs> In the Rose Garden. Hmm. Yep. Typical. Uh, uh. That must have been interesting riding in that outfit. Well, it was ridiculous. Look at how she's know. dressed, too. Uh. With sunshade. Yes. And a very smart clothes. Mm. Funny, isn't it? I it's think... so nice to see the same cups being used. You know, yes. <laughs> 
It's changed. Margaret was always a sort of slightly devilishly naughty little girl, but always, always got away with it because she could make her mother or her father laugh, which was very useful for her. Sitting on the wall, as we all used to do, and my mother's either singing a song or she's mimicking something. Must be a song, I think. At big dinner parties at Belmarrow, Margaret would fix her eye on the, the pages, who are the people like butlers in royal households, um, as they served other people. She would look, greedily look at them and follow them all the way around the table and then say something absolutely outrageous and watch them trying to not laugh. She was naughty with that sort of thing. Well, that looked like the Gelder to me. I remember my mother always saying, you know, quietly when they were not able to hear, this one, Elizabeth, was the important one because she was one day going to be the queen. That looks like Eddie Kent, doesn't mm, it? It does. We always were struck by uh, a certain seriousness in her demeanour, you know, and she, there was obviously a very strong character there. People, including me and the Queen, would come back from a day stalking um, with long details about how we crawled up a bird on our tummies doing this, that and the other. And that day, Margaret absolutely mad with boredom. She didn't want to know anything about it at all. They ended up being quite different characters, but, but the sisterhood remained very strongly. Oh, uh, and look. Margaret Rhodes again. And... <laughs> Who was taking it? So this, I think, oh, must have been... Oh, do look. Doesn't it make people look different? Frightfully funny. I can't remember what the reason was. It's quite fun trying to guess. We would never believe that was Grandma. <laughs> who's that in yellow, then? It's Betty Salisbury. It is Betty Salisbury. And who's the bald man, then, with the... Well, that's the moderator. Oh, the moderator. And, and then beside him is Jack Elton. And that's Bobberty on the right, isn't it? Uh, uh, recreating I those, think it was recreating that dotted photograph. photograph. <laughs> <laughs> ah, my crystal, 1984. Do you remember your little brother being born? So, not really. So I must have only been two. There's that many George running around. Winds hasn't changed at all, has it? No. Everything's still there in one piece, luckily. It's hard to tell if you're a boy or a girl in that to address. Thank you for that. <laughs> I think that normally happens at this stage of your life. You don't really have much of a decision what you're wearing. Yeah. There it's goes Granny. Granny. Gang Gang. My it's godmother, Sarah. Sarah, Sarah Chateau. Margot. Margot. Who's going? I'm keeping away from the children. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, Peter, with bright blonde hair. What's the cutting for? It's called Dash. Dash, Dash, Dash. And you know it's the word you use when you're cross. Dash. It comes out frightfully well as a dog's name, you see. Does it bite? No, not yet. But it might after it's finished with you. But... <laughs> She loves the idea of having her big family around her and uh, keeping an eye on them and making sure they're okay. You met the puppy, didn't you, William? And it's a very sort of um, subtle affection that she has. So she, she keeps an eye without necessarily, you, you know it, but she knows exactly what you're up to and what's going on. Zara! Zara! You see? Mummy looks great in blue. Yeah. She's still not convinced about the dress that I'm in. Sorry, I'm Get off my fingers, all right. <laughs> Take the hint. I think he's even going to give him a smile, isn't he? Touch your finger. Frequently, your relationship with your mother is a different one. Quite often, until you get married, I suspect, and have children, when that relationship with your mother changes a bit, um, and it, it it can become much closer because of that's the first time you really understand what mothers um, have been doing. <laughs> Look how excited you are, you've got a younger brother, that's fantastic. Uh, it didn't last long. I think it's that. See, I mean, this could, this could be literally uh, Christmas last year yeah, with you and Zara. exactly.
Christmas is always such an important family occasion. For most of my life, the Queen has hosted it at Sandringham in Norfolk. But some years, the whole family gathered at Windsor Castle. It can be a bit of a nightmare when you have everybody under one roof, but also it's, it's fantastic because you just never know what's going to happen. And it was particular fun at Windsor because of the huge space. Um, that long green corridor, which incidentally is full, of course, of the most marvellous furniture and pictures. But children used to ride their bicycles up and down there. They would, I don't think there were skateboards, but they, they, were, they, you know, they were hurling themselves about. Miraculously, I don't think any of the pictures or furniture was ever damaged. There's a huge blue giraffe that's been there for years and years and years, and uh, she sort of bounces around and her legs wobble all over the place, and she's got a big uh, uh, dandelion in her nose. And I remember that every year since I was small, it's been there, and George and Charlotte now play with this, and it's, it's, I'd say that becomes more of a centerpiece for the, uh, for the family, because it's just a, an old friend who's turned up every year. One of the drawing rooms was turned into the room where the Christmas tree was, which was completely magical. We see this is strong enough to get off. Get off. On Christmas Eve, at the end of tea, the Queen would open the big doors. And first of all, there were no lights on except on the Christmas tree, so that was very impressive. Because as the rooms were quite tall, it just filled. It was from floor to ceiling. It was amazing. And then, headed by a flock of children, in a state of great excitement, we would all go in and find our presents. <laughs> I always say to, to, to both my grandparents, why do you keep doing it at this age? Why do you have your whole family under one roof? It must just exhaust you. But they love it. They absolutely love it. At least that's what they say. On Christmas morning, they had early communion, breakfast, and then a big service um, in the chapel, and then Christmas lunch. You know, you can imagine all the nonsense of Christmas lunch which everybody has of paper hats and things that's coming out of crackers. There was a long table uh, which was divided, um, and then we, had, uh, you know, with our names, but we we knew because of the order where we were going to be. I remember once changing the the name on the person next to me, which was an awful thing to do, and it caused rather a lot of upset. I won't say who the person was, but I, I never forgot that. I didn't do it again. There's a look that everybody knows. If you know the Queen well enough, there's a look, and you know you've either, you've either overset the mark or you've said something really daft. Um, and in my case, I usually say something pretty daft. And uh, you get the sort of uh, the glazed look, the sort of thinking to yourself, who is this absolute idiot? A splendid garden. Aha. Oh, look. It could be anybody, couldn't it? Yes. <laughs> William, or it could be <laughs> George. No? Oh, couldn't it? Vera's figure, my sister. Susan. Susan, exactly. Yeah. The dog. Mm. Oh, look, it's Aunt Tony. Yes. My father's youngest sister. Oh, I actually adored her. <laughs> that is... That's Carl. Carl, my first cousin. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, this is where his gardening uh, so interest exactly. started. That's where it started. <laughs> Look at those prams, are amazing. I reckon that pram is still going. Look at 
Look how good-looking Grandpa is, though. He's an absolute stud. Hey? Yeah. Those glasses, slick back hair. Presumably he was in the Navy then? Still? And I think he I might know. have left by then. Yeah. <laughs> Same game. What is it with this family enrolling? Another fashion statement by Pa. <laughs> he walks like George. He does. Well, George walks like him. It's a purpose to the walk. Yeah. We probably chase each other around that garden a few times as well. Yeah, but not for a while. In the um, in the early days, when Gang Gang was around. Look at that little head poking out the side. Yeah. Let's see what's going on. <laughs> I think we were a bit big for that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I look. Sweet. They're very sweet little pups. That's a that's a corgi cross of some sort. I think. Yeah, that's not. Those can't be straight corgis. Oh, oh sweet. We well, think how many corgis Granny must have had in her, her life. And, and the fact that none of us have ever really been attacked, bitten, mm. or been allergic to dogs. Otherwise, it could be quite awkward. <laughs> Very keen. Yeah. Well, these are different sort of puppies. Mm. And do you think that's um, going to be the one that became your dog? What, um, Flame? Mm. I don't know, it might be. One pup is taking the camera. Yes. Have you still got that camera somewhere? No. Yeah. Well, I don't think so. Yeah, see, it really flexes. Yes. Perhaps I have. I remember so hard trying to get it to see, you could see the image of it. Nice, charming, friendly dogs. <laughs> Endlessly trying to bite. She's not a bad horsewoman either. She'd soon graduated from playing with ponies on the nursery floor to the real thing. There is always an inherent risk with, a, with an animal that it'll do something untoward or different. And that's partly your own skill and partly your own, your own ability to take risks. My mama first took the salute at Trooping the Colour in 1949, when my grandfather was unable to be there, riding solo along the mall at the head of the birthday parade. Every year, it's impeccably organised. But in 1981, when I was riding behind her with my father and the Duke of Kent, the sound of shots came from the crowd. Her Majesty the Queen. In the uniform of Colonel in Chief, the Welsh Guards. Field Marshal, His Royal Highness the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, Colonel of the Grenadier Guards. Oh. Behind her, hello, some little disturbance in the approach road. You've noticed the Queen's horse does canter a little bit. And I'm on the grey horse, I wish we almost stopped for some reason. And others were going to have policemen rushing. You know. The Queen, of course, kept going perfectly. This chap, as it turned out, fired blanks, but um, you no, know, at the time. Uh, funny enough, it's you know it's one of those things that you often think about, riding down the mall. You know, at any minute, who might do something crazy because. There are all sorts of people about. You 
dreams continue. That's the great thing, as Ben Maher certainly did. You're going to suddenly rush off in panic, you know. Yes, I noticed the Queen was looking round. I presumably, I had curiosity to know what had happened. But she seems quite unperturbed at that point. It's extraordinary to see that again, I must say. Because, you know, it's such a long time ago. Burmese receiving a reassuring pat from a Majesty Queen, but he's a very experienced, wise old fellow. And she's a marvellous writer, so... You know, she's got a marvellous way with horses. They do strong stuff, you know. <laughs> The Queen's long experience of the military goes back to the war years when she herself served in the ATS and she often saw her father in uniform. She spent at least part of the war based at Windsor where other members of the family were given shelter. The late King was very generous to my mother because she was a widow. My father was killed in the war and we used to go and stay at Windsor because of the bombing. At the time, I think we just thought it was a change of scene, you know, but I now realize that it was almost certainly to move us out of the line of the Blitz. Um, I don't know how effective it was, because it's a huge landmark and pretty well unmissable, I would have thought. As a reminder that we're still bringing down the Raiders, here's one that came to stay near Windsor Castle. There were those black curtains on all the big windows, you know, which made the place look horribly gloomy. The exciting thing to us was that when we went out into, into the garden or the park, we saw an anti-aircraft gun sitting, I mean, not more than probably 100 yards from the castle. The, the, the butler would come in and bow very low and say, purple warning, Your Majesty. Purple warning was obviously, you know, the enemy's on the way, or I don't know, something like that. Water is a munition of war. Don't waste it. You have seen this, and this, and this. In the bathrooms on the nursery floor that we were on, there was a very severe black line, about four inches from the bottom of the bath. There was a, a line round the inside of the bath to show the depth of water you were allowed. It was only about, I think, four or five inches or something. It wasn't a great deal. One of the things I do remember were the hand-me-downs, which were invaluable because they were clothing coupons. So they were very kind to me, my cousins, and I think it was Princess Elizabeth mainly. They let me have one or two of their dresses. But there was one blue one with seagulls all over it, and it's always stayed in my mind. Windsor has always occupied a special place in my mother's heart, with plenty of memories going back to those years in the war. On one occasion, the talent for improvisation my grandmother had learnt up at Glam's Castle came to the rescue. Tea was on a little sort of terrace, which came out from sort of rather halfway up the castle in some funny way. And it was the King and Queen and Princess, Princess Margaret, Elizabeth Longman and me. And um, in the middle of sitting down to tea, we suddenly heard loud American voices. And there was one awful moment, and the king said, oh, my God, I forgot. It's General Eisenhower taking, coming here and taking a lot round the castle. And, I mean, they were in a hopeless position because they couldn't get out of their little balcony place they were on to go down and greet him. And... Uh, they couldn't shout at him. They couldn't do anything. So the Queen Mother and the King, without with looking at each other, but without a word spoken, got up and got under the tablecloth, uh, hotly followed by Liz, all four children behind them. And we sat under this tablecloth, quivering with laughter, while the American voices managed to go by and eventually disappear.
One of the things that I admired very much was the opening of the Olympic Games in 2012 in London. When we saw James Bond, and the first thing one thought, that looks jolly much like Buckingham Palace. My God, it's, it is Buckingham Palace. And then a couple of corgis appear, and I thought, have they even found corgis to look like that? Mr. Bond, Your Majesty. And then one came into the room, and there was the Queen sitting with her back to the, to the camera, and I thought, is that somebody being very clever impersonating her? Good evening, Mr. Bond. And she got up, and it, and it was her. Your Majesty. But I was sat next to uh, Lord Coe at the time, and uh, I remember certain expletives coming out of my mouth, and I realised <laughs> what was going on. Then we saw her leave the palace, and sometime later, something dropped out of a helicopter. When she seemed to jump out of that helicopter... And... She did jump, she jumped, she jumped. Everyone thinks it was a joke, she just jumped. She appeared at the stadium. People went absolutely wild. And what a good sport to take part in something like that. And it shows uh, she has a wonderful sense of humour and the sense of occasion as well. I told her how much I admired that she'd taken part in it and I told her that we, we all thought it was absolutely wonderful. I think she enjoyed the surprise because apparently she hadn't even told her children. It was actually a very well-kept secret, probably uh, more state secret than most of the uh, intelligence documents that she receives. But uh, it's, uh, it was one of those ones where um, uh, nothing was told to any of us and clearly they knew that certain grandchildren would probably go around telling everybody too much. In fact, the only member of my family who was in on the secret was my father. Buckingham Palace has witnessed many extraordinary events in its 200-year history. One of them was my parents' wedding day in November 1947, which I think lifted the spirits of a nation caught up in post-war austerity. They have their own filmed memento of the scenes backstage, believe it or not, more than 68 years ago. This is the scene bef before lunch. Mm. And that's in the ball supper, ball supper room. Exactly. There's a rather lot of cakes. cakes. Much more difficult. Uh, to be able to fulfil that kind of role without this level of support that, that you you have from um, a husband like my father. I'm sure that's made an enormous difference to her ability to cope. Oh, Margaret. Still smoking a cigarette. All these were taken by yes. uh, a little gran yeah, granny and, mm. and Freddy, Queen of Greece. Yes. <laughs> Queen Mary, my great grandmother. Pammy. Yeah. Margaret. Margaret Rose. Pammy Mountbatten. Marina. There's Aunt Maria, the Duchess of Kent. Mine. So Mine. And, and yeah. Alexandra with her. Alexandra, yes. And. Any light body, just going to curtsy. Yes, you look. The page boys, and that's Richard as, as a yes. small boy. The Gloucesters, yes, that's right. Mm. Uh -huh. Aha. <laughs> How splendid that. Is that that Russian tiara, is it? That... No, that was my mama's tiara. That's my mama's one. Which fell to pieces. Did it? Just before the, m our wedding. Oh. And that's getting into the carriage. But they don't show Jane for the dog. Was the dog with you? Yes, they left her behind in my in my room. Oh no! So she was underneath the rug. The rug yeah. This is quite funny. Look. No. <laughs> the horse didn't think that was like at all funny. At all. Oh! <laughs> I said, okay, we're not used to this sort of thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now they all, everybody rushed you. out after. Yes. 
full of confetti. Yes, and, and poor Jane fell out of the carriage at the station in a shower of confetti. No. <laughs> Both my parents have remained inherently curious about life and things, although there is a pattern to the year, everything is different. And the things that they do during the year and the challenges that the country faces and that they face as individual changes each year. And that's, uh, I'm sure, has made a difference because they've always had to, had to adjust and, and move on and, and adjust again. Ah, so this must be the Dime Willie photo shoot. Uh, wow, everyone's looking quite dressed up. Yeah. <laughs> Look how young everybody is. Here we have the whole family. Yeah. Ed hasn't changed a bit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, late. It's late covers. <laughs> it's just strolling in. Oh, we got we made before growing grandpa, so that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is when you think to yourself, how many photo things like this have they had to sit for? Yeah. <laughs> I would love to know their um, secrets. I think it's um, it's absolutely fantastic, and uh, I have regularly asked them both how on earth they uh, how they've managed it because they are, uh, you know, the most lovely couple, and uh, I I hope Catherine and I have the same sort of. Um, future ahead of us where we can um, be as happily married as they are for 68 years. Everyone watch the birdie. Cheese. <laughs> <laughs> you, if you're the photographer, you're already yes, bricking you're already yourself because you've, got, cause you've three known, yeah, You've got three, like three shots. shots before Grandpa turns around and goes, right, that's yeah. it. And just gets up and walks off. Trying to get one I think there's obviously a closeness. You know, and they have lots of jokes together, you know. It's, it's, it's quite a close family, and they tease each other. Sort of, just, <laughs> probably it's not rude, but they just tease each other. There's a lot of laughter. There used to be an awful lot of banter. I now think that my grandmother has got tired of a lot of the banter because she never really won. And my grandfather still loves the banter, but he's now turned that on his grandchildren um, and probably the great-grandchildren eventually. I still view her more as the Queen than my grandmother. It gets hammered into, not hammered into you, but you, you have this huge amount of respect for, for your boss. And, um, and I always view her as my boss, but occasionally as, as, as a grandmother. And the more, the more grandmother bits, the more I can get advice and, and suck all that information out of her that, and all that experience that she's had for so long. Thank you very much. <laughs> One of the most colourful events each year is the gathering of the Knights of the Garter, the oldest order of chivalry. It's one of the things that gives each year its rhythm, like the changing of the seasons or the arrival of swallows and house martins in summer. And the honour is in the Sovereign's personal gift. She came here for dinner with some friends. It was after dinner, to my astonishment, she said, um, She'd given me the garter, or was going to give me the garter. And I remember thinking, good gracious, could I think about it? He said, Alexandra, I'm terribly sorry, you cannot, because it's already been gazetted, and it's going to be announced tomorrow morning. The garter ceremony is, is very beautiful and really unforgettable. And I felt very much honored to have been made a, a, a Knight of the Garter. It's very colourful, and those strange plumed hats. And if there's wind, you're always a little bit worried that something might just take off. <laughs> At the coronation, it was Queen Siloti of Tonga who captured the hearts of the crowd when she rode in an open carriage in pouring rain. So it was perhaps rather appropriate that on my parents' four-month world tour later that year, one of the first stops was to see her in the Pacific. Tonga. Yeah, that marvellous Queen Siloti. Yes, look at the size of her. Amazing. She's taller than Papa. <laughs> 
I mean, she was the man who got so dry with an open carriage yes. before a beforehand, wasn't she? This was taken by an equerry who didn't know how to I use a cine it. camera. <laughs> And this was the house we lived in. Sucking pigs and fruit and all sorts of things. <laughs> and sitting on the floor, which is always all right, up, up for a up bit. Up to a point, yes. Yeah. And incredibly hot. Oh, amazingly yes. hot. But you always manage to look so incredibly cool. That was the Australian aquary. We got in covered in garlands. <laughs> <laughs> and this is New Zealand. This yeah. is down in the South Island, I think. I'm not very good at driving, I don't think. Papa hadn't taken it up by then, had he? Well, presumably a sheep station. Yes. Yeah. Well, who's that with you? He's the owner of the station, I think. At least you're sitting down by now. You're getting rather good at it now. <laughs> Driving oh, the sheep. Look. The merinos. Yeah, exactly, for miles. So did you spend a few days on them? Well, it was just, the, I think, a weekend, weekend off. Weekend off, yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh, what a long way up. way up, that one. And in those days, it didn't seem no. so difficult. I think no, this is South Australia. We, we, we just borrowed some police horses. Yeah. Oh, like we did, do you remember, in Canada? In Canada, yes. We Road went from right the on, the, from, on the prairie. From when the that train. horse ran away with me, do you remember that? And for some reason, he didn't come with didn't us. Didn't want to ride. While they were making their way home, my sister and I set off in the Royal Yacht Britannia to meet them in the Mediterranean. It was her maiden voyage and a great excitement for both of us. This is the first time any of the royal visitors have seen the splendid new yacht, which was named by the Queen herself. It has been nearly five months since the Queen was with her children, though she has kept close contact with them throughout her tour by radio telephone. The people that were around us most, which is Nanny Light Body and Miss Peebles, were still there, so... Because we moved around establishments and houses, we got quite used to moving. Same people, new environment, you know, done that before. We had um, two sailors who, who used to look after us, stop us falling over the side. They were absolutely wonderful, as only royal yachtsmen can be at guarding us, you know, taking us off. And we did endless sort of things with them, you know, swabbing the decks and learning to cheese ropes and tie knots and all that stuff, you know. Then we got involved in everything. It must have been a frightful nuisance to them all. Poor drummer. <laughs> Once we were reunited, my mama had her camera out again as she'd so often did in Britannia. Never-ending source of things to do and play with, so it was never a dull moment. So that would have been a very good idea, that was the fire hydrant. It, it provided uh, not only a haven, so to speak, but you could be stable on board because you didn't have to move things, you didn't have to pack and unpack, and it was a, a wonderfully secure place to have holidays. And, and I imagine from uh, my mother's perspective that was particularly important, um, and the crew were uh, part of that, and you always knew nothing went any further. So you'd, it was a time when people could genuinely uh, enjoy the time off. We're very lucky to have had her as an aunt. 
you know, she included my brother and I in holidays and, and her life, really. We felt very lucky. With Britannia, it just felt, because you were so far away from everything, it was a really magical time. It looks very hot. Do you think they're on the west coast of Scotland? Have it about tea time. Prince of Wales looking really young. God, they all look so glamorous, didn't they, in those days? I've never seen any of this footage before. That must be Andrew and Ed. So much fun. I wonder who that is. That Ooh. <laughs> well, that's Sarah. Yep. That can't be me. <gasps> Things have changed. But the slide I do remember really well. It was the best fun that I must say. You could get quite a long way, couldn't you, sometimes? Uh, yes, you see, I got quite a long way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you were big enough and heavy I enough know, to exactly, get, exactly. get further than anybody else. Well, Papa could get quite a long way. Mm. But that, that slide was very yeah. popular. It was always better with the water coming down, yes. wasn't it? Piped aboard for the final time, the Queen and Duke of Edinburgh came to say goodbye to a yacht whose royal duties spanned nearly half a century. In the course of 90 years, there are bound to be sadnesses within the family, as well as joys. And the decommissioning of Britannia nearly 20 years ago now was a particularly poignant moment. Was it emotional? Um. I think when we left her, it was quite emotional. They really saying goodbye to a home, I think. And and everything that was associated with it, you were saying goodbye to. That was pretty sad. She's got a sort of what I call a compartmentalised brain, which is that she can, she can shut the door on a, on a worry uh, about either the children or something else, um, and can, she can shut it and contain it and manage to be her own self. Is the Queen an optimist? <laughs> Um, I wouldn't have said so, no, not really. A pessimist? No, that's why I hesitate, because I don't think she's inherently a pessimist. I think I am, but I don't think she is, funnily enough. Um, but no, I don't get the feeling that she's wildly optimistic about, um, about life. But a, a, a genuine realist and a pragmatist, I think. Uh, where? Oh, was this going to South Africa? Yes. In Vanguard. Vanguard. Was Vanguard. It was that, which was that fantastic battleship. Yes. The last one. Playing the um, with the midshipmen. <laughs> and that's in the Drakensberg. Yep. In South Africa. Whose house was that? It wasn't, Somebody it was a hotel. It was a hotel. Mm. In many ways, it was my mama's coming of age in South Africa that set the tone for the age of Elizabeth. The message she sent to the entire empire and commonwealth on her 21st birthday was perhaps slightly different 
from any of her predecessors as heir to the throne. Through the inventions of science, I can do what was not possible for any of them. I can make my solemn act of dedication with the whole empire listening. I should like to make that dedication now. It is very simple. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. But I shall not have strength to carry out this resolution alone unless you join in it with me, as I now invite you to do. I know that your support will be unfailingly given. God help me to make good my vow, and God bless all of you who are willing to share in it. You can't undertake what she has been doing all through her life if you don't have a sense of faith. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't believe you could do it otherwise. Because you, one, one has a position which is in some ways alone, but, but, but one, is, one, is, one depends on all sorts of people, not only the people as such, but one's family, one's collaborators. But deep down, I think, the, the roots, it's, in, it's important to know that you are not alone. She's led where others have faltered. She's just been the most incredible grandmother to me. Um, and I wish her a very, very happy 90th birthday. And I hope she realizes how um, dear and fond everyone is of her. Apart from happy birthday, um, I would say thank you. Thank you so much for, for showing us the way. Thank you for your service and dedication to the country, to the Commonwealth. Yeah, I would say thank you. Well, what I'd like to say to her is, I hope that you know how proud the king would be of you if he was able to tell you. Because I think that she's so carried out her duties as queen as to be beyond belief. Just to wish her many congratulations for uh, reaching such a wonderful age and just giving her a lot of love and huge admiration, which she's given me all my life, really. Better put it in my birthday card, hadn't I? <laughs>